So a lot of people who have pelvic pain, they have a compensatory exhalation strategy. So we're taking a rib cage that's in this inhaled position, and as we exhale, we're actually squeezing that rib cage further so the diaphragm does not go into the relaxed position, and the guts do not come off that pelvic floor, and so we actually get a downward pressure into that pelvic floor on exhalation instead of the upward pressure that we would be hoping for. Hey guys, Greg Chaplin, physical therapist and strength and conditioning specialist. In today's video, we're gonna answer the question, can pelvic floor pain cause shortness of breath? And in answering this question, we're going to explain the relationship between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor and why this is the key to understand in order to get rid of chronic pelvic pain. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So we're going to start off by answering the question, can pelvic floor pain cause shortness of breath? And the answer to this is kind of. So these two things tend to be associated, but it's not that pelvic floor pain is the cause of the shortness of breath, but actually usually more a symptom. So let's talk about pelvic floor pain in general and some of the common things that we're gonna see, and then we'll go into exactly why you can feel shortness of breath when you have pelvic floor pain. So just to review, here's the pelvis, and the pelvic floor is the collection of muscles that sits at the bottom of the pelvis. So when we think about anatomically what's going on with pelvic floor pain, there's a relationship that happens between the diaphragm, the guts, and the pelvic floor. So if we think about this as a cylinder, we have our rib cage here, and at the bottom of the rib cage sits our diaphragm, and our diaphragm dones up like this when it's in a rested position, and then when we inhale, it pulls down like this. And when that happens, the rib cage goes from something like this shape here to a little bit of a wider shape where the ribs move out to the side, the sternum moves forward, and the back also expands backwards. So we have a 360 expansion of the rib cage, and we have a downward movement of the diaphragm. Now, if we imagine between this diaphragm and the pelvic floor, we have our guts. So we have our intestines, we have all the fluid elements and our organs that sit between these two points. So when that diaphragm moves down, the guts, which are all fluids, which are basically incompressible, they have to move down as well. And so what receives that downward movement of the guts as we inhale is actually those muscles in the pelvic floor. So to illustrate this point, I'm gonna use something that I picked up watching some Bill Hartman videos. And if you haven't seen his channel, I would recommend you do that. A lot of great stuff on there. So we're gonna use a tube of toothpaste analogy here. So if you imagine that the diaphragm is here at the top of the tube of toothpaste, and here at the bottom is the pelvic floor, and in the middle are the guts. So as we exhale, we're supposed to be able to get the guts to actually move up as the diaphragm here moves up and the pelvic floor contracts and ascends a little bit. As we inhale and the diaphragm moves down, we're squeezing the contents, so the guts, down. And in this tube of toothpaste, you can see that the toothpaste is all starting to collect and push down on the pelvic floor here or the bottom. And so what happens in most cases in pelvic floor pain is that we get this constant downward pressure. So we can say that the diaphragm is actually in a descended, contracted, and inhaled state. So we're gonna have a rib cage that probably looks a little bit something like this. And so this is actually where the shortness of breath comes in. So when we wanna take a breath in, we typically try to inhale and that pulls down the diaphragm. If the diaphragm is already in an inhaled position and we try to inhale even further and pull that diaphragm down even further, it actually can't descend further than it already is. So this is kind of analogous to if you had a fist and someone says, okay, now make a fist. Well, you can't make a fist because you're already making a fist. So if you have your hand open on the other hand and someone says make a fist, you can easily make a fist. So in terms of our positional goals for the diaphragm, we need this diaphragm to actually come into an ascended position, which is the relaxed or exhaled position of the diaphragm. Now, when that happens here in the rib cage, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a relieving downward pressure. So the pressure is gonna be able to come up through the guts and in the pelvic floor, we're actually gonna have a contraction in the pelvic floor that lifts the pelvic floor 
up just slightly. In tandem, we're relieving the downward pressure because we're picking the guts up and we're moving the diaphragm up, but we're also contracting that pelvic floor and those two are gonna move together. So on inhale, diaphragm moves down, pelvic floor moves down. On exhale, they both move up. Now, when we run into trouble is when we can't get that upward movement of the guts in the relaxed position of the diaphragm on exhale. And there are a couple of common mistakes that we're gonna make. So a lot of people who have pelvic pain, they have a compensatory exhalation strategy. So what do I mean by compensatory exhalation strategy? So upon exhalation, we're supposed to get a change in shape from the ribs being out like this to the side to the ribs actually coming in a little bit and closer together. Now, if we have increased use of some of the superficial abdominals, including the rectus abdominis here, and a little bit of the external obliques, which are a little bit more anterior, on the rib cage rather than lateral. If we have a lot of that, but we don't have the deep abdominals to help change this shape, what we end up getting is we get a pulled down sternum that looks like this. And as you see, that decreases the front to back diameter of this rib cage, but it also keeps those ribs flared out to the side. Now, when we do that, that's akin to taking this shape here. And then instead of allowing the contents to go back up, it's almost like taking this shape here and then squeezing down further. So we're taking a rib cage that's in this inhaled position. And as we exhale, we're actually squeezing that rib cage further. So the diaphragm does not go into the relaxed position and the guts do not come off that pelvic floor. And so we actually get a downward pressure into that pelvic floor on exhalation instead of the upward pressure that we would be hoping for. Now, the other thing that we're dealing with in pelvic floor pain is usually an imbalance of the pelvic floor from front to back. So what do we mean by this? So if we look down the pelvic floor here, we could separate the pelvic floor by a line here in the middle so that we have a front portion of the pelvic floor and a back portion of the pelvic floor. So what we're usually looking at is a back of the pelvic floor that's relatively restricted. And then we have a front of the pelvic floor here that's relatively open, but it's gonna feel tight in the front of that pelvic floor and painful because we get that downward pressure. So what we need to do in order to get that front of the pelvic floor to lift up is not only to get the exhalation strategy happening in the rib cage the way that we want in the diaphragm to come up and those guts to come up, but we also need to restore this relationship front to back in the pelvic floor. So we need the front of the pelvic floor to lift up and then we need the back of the pelvic floor here which is usually a little bit closed down, we actually need that to open up a little bit. So why does this happen? So regardless of what kind of pelvis you have, so if you have a pelvis that's kind of shaped like this, shaped like this, and regardless of what orientation of the pelvis you have, so whether you're a sway back and the lower half comes forward more than the upper half, or whether you have anterior pelvic tilt and you get kind of pushed forward in space, but you're tilted forward there, or if it just kind of stays uh, neutral flat, but gets pushed forward. In all those cases, the common link is that we're getting pushed forward in space at the pelvis. And so if we keep an eye here on this femur and we push the pelvis forward in space, what we're gonna see is that the sacrum actually comes closer to this back of the femur. And we'll see that that space there, if I keep twisting that, actually gets compressed. Now, obviously I'm exaggerating those pelvic motions a little bit so that you can see what's going on. But overall, as we move the pelvis forward in space, these twist back into external rotation and all those hip external rotator muscles back here, they get tight and that gums up that backside of the pelvis. Now, if we get a gummed up backside of the pelvis and we have constant pressure down, what that's gonna do is that's gonna put even more stress on that front side of the pelvis. So we have, in order to fix this, not only to get that diaphragm to come up, the correct abdominal engagement to happen, the guts to move off that pelvic floor, but we have to restore this front to back imbalance by opening up the back of the pelvis, moving the pelvis backwards in space, and then finally we can get the front of that pelvis to start to work a little bit better. Now in terms of some strategies, we might have to initially take away gravity and either go into a side-lying position, prone lying position, or even an inverted position where the butt comes above the upper body to 
even reverse that influence of gravity as we get a little bit better restoring the breathing mechanics and also that front to back management of shifting the pelvis in space so we can open the back of the pelvis and get that front of the pelvis to start working a little better. Then we wanna to start to use positions that actually help the front of the pelvis uh, contract a little bit better. And that's usually gonna be positions where the hip is at 90 degrees and the pelvis is coming into a little bit more internal rotation and nutation. Uh, that's not always the case across the board, but that's a good goal to get to. And then over time, we can progressively load those movements as we get better at managing these forces and we get better at preserving these strategies. And ultimately, that's what's going to strengthen those pelvic floor muscles so that that pelvic pain is not going to come back. Okay, guys, so to recap, the shortness of breath that we're feeling when we have pelvic floor pain is related to a diaphragm that's already descended, trying to be pulled down even further. What we have to do to get rid of that is we have to take our compensatory exhalation strategy where we're compressing the front of the rib cage to one where we're actually moving the ribs in on exhalation and allowing that diaphragm to come up. This is going to restore the ability to get the guts off of that pelvic diaphragm and contract the front of that pelvic diaphragm as we exhale. Once we can do that, we're not gonna have the shortness of breath anymore because we're gonna have room to take a breath in from there. And then we're gonna go through our progressions that we talked about in order to restore the function of that pelvic floor to get rid of that pain. So if you're someone that's struggling with pelvic pain or just improving movement in general, go ahead and head over to chaplainperformance.com, book in on a call and see if you'll be a good fit for the one-on-one -on -one movement coaching program where I work one-on-one -on -one with people to improve movement and performance. So thanks a lot for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and like. If you have any questions at all, leave them down below in the comments. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when I upload a new video. And until next time, thanks a lot for watching. Peace.